please. Sometimes a warrior just has to kind of lay down on the ground for a minute, just stay there for a second, have a good bleed. So what are you waiting for? I don't know, something amazing. Matt, for maybe the win. Gafford, uh -oh. buckle up! Oh! <laughs> Welcome into the basketball podcast of Mid America, all you cool cats and kittens. I was Perfect. To I was told to say it like that. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know, Tiger King on Netflix is taking over the quarantined world especially my my place so uh, i had to throw that a reference in there uh they are not a sponsor so i guess we you know, don't have to talk about we're it we're trying to distance ourselves from who joe exotic is but at the same time we're fascinated it, it's true it's very true uh, we welcome you into the basketball podcast of mid-america between two very socially distant people and seth campbell and as always scotty borderline and we are here to give you the basketball content that you are craving right now as we enter into the latter parts of March and into the beginning of April, which this is, should be, we should know who the final four is right now, right, Scotty? We should. And instead, we don't even know who the first four were because there was no NCAA tournament. So we're grieving through the process. Uh, and then meanwhile, also learning out different things about our spouses and the people that we are quarantined with. It has been quite the adventure. Uh, I figured out that Megan, who is my wife, her parents have come up because they've been bored and wow. they, they live in Little Rock. And so they've come up to Fayetteville for a few times and they're like, hey, uh, it was spring break one time and her mom's a teacher and her dad gets off on uh, weird days. And so it's in the middle of the week and he's like, we're just going to come up. I'm like, okay, come on. We're not going to do anything. So we play board games or whatever. Um, I don't think she listens to this podcast. So I'm going to go ahead and say this. Go uh, ahead. Megan's mom found out that like for one of the, one of the weird things I asked for Christmas was like a house plant. Like, I don't know. We a had house a, plant. Yeah. We had a plant. It was something that's pretty easy to get. So you just have a plant and you know, I like keeping things alive. It's yeah, easy. Mal, Mal went out the other day and got a couple of succulents from Walmart. See, like, like they're easy to keep alive. You know, there's something about maybe purifying the air there. I'm not real for sure, but I, I did like, I like the idea of having a house plant. It was easier than having a dog uh, to take care of, right? That's a fact. Well, she bought me a house plant for Christmas, but I think in her mind, that meant that I really, really like plants. I've got two plants for Christmas, and then there was this huge plant. She's like, oh, well, you can take that plant and cut it up and then it'll make more plants. And I'm like, I don't want more plants. I don't need more plants. And so that was the first time she came up. The second time she comes up, she brings with her seeds in this planter for 72 plants. Wow. And I that's, figured, that's a little extreme. I figured out that I apparently she thinks I have a really good green thumb. The problem is now she's giving me these plants and I have to make sure that I don't kill them. Right. Because your mother-in-law gave you these plants. What's it going to look like next time she comes over? And it's like, so what happened to so-and-so plant? Oh, oh, dude, like two days after she leaves, she's going to call or FaceTime and be like, how are the plants? How are the plants? And so we're, uh, I, I'm now I've become, whether or not I wanted to, I have now become king of the Campbell jungle wow. at uh, the duplex where I live. That's, that's what I found out about myself in quarantine. That's funny. What about you, Scotty? So I figured out, so my wife is a, a an elementary school teacher in Springdale. And we were, so my wife feels like she's been cooped up in the apartment a lot, uh -huh. which of course we have. And she likes to get out sometimes and we just go, we get in my car and we just go for a drive. Like the other day we drove out to Goshen and almost to Huntsville before we turned around. And it's just a really pretty area out there. It's a good place to kind of clear your head a little bit. Before we got in the car, we were walking down the sidewalk outside of our complex and my wife sees some sidewalk chalk. So she picks up some and she had seen this graphic that, or this, this sidewalk drawing on Instagram from some teacher, I guess it's like teachers of Instagram page or whatever. And it said stronger together, six feet apart. And it was decorated and all these 
different colors and it, it looked really nice. So my wife tried to do it and my wife's got really good penmanship, but apparently cause she can't spell. <laughs> so all at once she, she writes the word stronger, which is great. It's all spelled correctly. And then she gets to the word together and she asks me all at once, is there a, an A in together? And then before I could even answer, she wrote, she started writing an A. <laughs> and then I was like, no, there's no A in the word together. Trust me. And so she went down about three squares on the sidewalk and started doing it again. And I took a picture of her. It's, and I it's put on, it on Twitter. Twitter. It's, it's really, fantastic. It's really funny. You definitely need to look it up. Uh, NW, NWA Scotty, right? At yeah. NWA Scotty. Uh, because it looks like she's throwing a toga party. Stronger yeah. toga. Yeah, stronger toga. Um, and then I think this was just a couple of days ago. So it might have been Sunday, Sunday evening. She's got in one of these moods where she found America's Funniest Home Videos on TV. And she was literally laughing at everything. Even the clips that weren't even that funny, she was like making herself laugh. And so I tweeted SOS to that. And then yesterday, which would have been Monday, I get a tweet from the official AFV Twitter account and says, no one can save you, all caps. <laughs> and then 8.15 the next morning, she puts a... Apparently, we didn't put up laundry the night before. We oh. were doing laundry and we didn't put it up. So she grabbed this camouflage T-shirt that she has and she put it on her two-year-old boxer. That poor dog. And then it get like it just it's every day, it's every day. So the other night I finished, or yes, I think it was Monday afternoon. I finished Tiger King after I finished one of my season reviews. I wrapped up the Tiger King series, and my wife is just like. Well, you talk about it all the time, so I guess I just I, I guess I need to to watch the end of it and see what you're talking about. And so she's wanting to watch that and at the same time she's drawing a poster board for the kids that are in her class that she doesn't get to see. She's gonna make this big poster board. I'm gonna take a picture of it, of her holding it, and apparently our dogs are gonna be in it in the good, picture. Good. And so she wants, she's doing that and she wants to watch Tiger King. So I'm in my office working and I hear a bunch of movement going on in the living room area. She has pulled the kitchen table into the living room in front of the TV so she can do her, pers po her poster board and Amen. watch Tiger King. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, I got stir crazy the other day and... I think I'm more like Mallory and Megan is more like you in the situation. I started just singing the words to uh, the national anthem. And, wow. And I don't know why. And Megan comes into, I, I come into the room that Megan is and I finish up and she looks at me and I go, I thought maybe if I sang the national anthem that sports would happen afterwards. And she said, that's not how it works. It's not going to happen, buddy. Sorry. I know it was, it was a sad day. All right. Enough of the quarantine talk. Let's get down and actually focus our minds so that uh, we won't go crazy on some season reviews. There are three season reviews right now on Whole Hog Sports there that we have yet to talk about here on the Whole Hog, or not the Whole Hog podcast, the basketball podcast of Mid-America. Number one is Jalen Harris. As we told you on the last podcast last week, or if you are just joining us for the first time, you can go back and listen to that podcast. But Jalen Harris has decided that he wants to transfer. So we're not going to spend just a ton of time on him. Uh, real quick, Scotty, though, what was uh, one high and one low or one pro and one con that you saw from Jalen Harris in his game this year? Yeah, we talked about it a little bit last week, too. You know, just the way that his role changed year over year at Arkansas. Like, he was the lead guard in Mike Anderson's final season and played really well. Uh, he was averaging, you know, 30 minutes a game. Averaged almost six assists a game. Uh, his scoring numbers, you know, probably weren't where he wanted them to be. But, I mean, he was he was still a guy that, that would give you, you know, six, eight, nine points a game on top of the, you know, five or six assists. He would get into double figures and assists every now and then. And then his first year under Eric Musselman, you know, he kind of gets designated to a bench role. And I thought he 
he handled that about as well as he could have. Uh, I heard, I, I got a message from someone in, in Jalen's circle after last week's podcast. And he basically said, you know, this year was basically a, a test of Jalen's faith. And, you know, I think he he thought that Jalen handled, you know, the situation that, that he was in, you know, about as well as he could have. And that, you know, that's what I wrote too. And, um, you just have to you kind of have to tip your hat to a guy like that. It can't be easy to see your your role. You know, I, I said last week, I don't know if it changed drastically, but um, changed quite a bit. Um, you know, he wasn't the lead guard anymore. He was more often than not, you know, that, that first guard off the bench until the end of the year when, when, uh, when Desi Sills was kind of making his push. But, you know, tip of the hat to, to Jalen for that. And, you know, one of his weaknesses, you know, he had some pretty costly turnovers. Like, I obviously think of the one against Mississippi State where he left his feet and all at the same time, like, he jumped in the air, spun, tried to pass to an Arkansas guard in front of the bench, and the pass got picked off and taken the other way for a dunk. Um, and then, you know, he, he had a couple of games early in the season against a SWAC team, an Ohio Valley team, where I think he had like nine combined turnovers. Like you just want your guards against that kind of competition to play a little bit cleaner floor game. Um, and then I, I just thought at certain points, you know, his shooter recognition defensively and like the urgency on some of his closeouts on the perimeter uh, weren't weren't always real solid. But credit to Jalen, I really really enjoyed watching him play here. You know, when he when he played well, and then obviously we'll always remember that spin two steps in the lane two hand dunk against Auburn that was probably the 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 best single moment of his his Arkansas career yeah I could I can definitely agree with that also probably the maybe the Ole Miss scoop layup that he had I think it was on the day that Arkansas was honoring the 94 team last March yeah when they finally broke out the the 94 throwback uniforms which that was the a, best yeah that way. yeah for sure that was a that was a pretty fun day and Jalen capped it in style so props to him for handling his role on this team and you know best of luck to him as he moves on also some news that happened this week is Mason Jones came out and declared for the NBA draft and if you're not familiar with the rules then if you declare for the NBA draft you can still come back it's if you sign an agent or not. If you sign an agent, then you cannot come back. It I was, think I think there are credited. I think there are like NCAA approved agents that you can sign with, and I think you can go through the process with those with guys. one of those guys. But the thing is, there's only like I want to say I read the other day. There's only like 25 or 30 of them for all of these guys. So that you have to take that into consideration. But I think he's got until June. Th- I think the, the the deadline for un- NCAA underclassmen to go through the draft process and maintain your college eligibility is June 3rd. This is just such a weird year as well, because normally you would have those guys that, you know, they would get looked at. They would have other people look at them. They get to maybe go to the combine, maybe go and play in those scrimmages and stuff that that might not happen this year. We don't even know if the draft is going to be at the same place for the NBA or the same time for the NBA as it normally is. So that'll be something to look out for. The language that Mason used, you don't want to read too far into this, but it almost mm-hmm. seemed like he wasn't coming back. But I just wanted to point out that they, he still has that option right now with all information that is public at the time of this recording. Yeah, for sure. And you know, you you made a good point. Like the the wording in his statement didn't probably bring about a lot of optimism for Arkansas fans for him to return. But yeah, like you said, he's he's still. I mean, he's still got the the option to to come back, and you know, if Mason Jones comes back on next for next year, that I mean, that's that's going to be as as fun of a team as no. I'll probably cover for a long time. No, you're not you're not joking, Scotty. Say so if I'm wrong here, but for me, the thought process if I am Mason Jones is when you're looking about the decision of coming back or whether you want to stay. It seems it kind of gets broken down into, all right, can I have a better year next year no. than I have this year? And the answer is no. I mean, you were as you were co-SEC player of the year in your conference. You put up astronomical numbers 
scoring, making 30 points seem regular, hitting 40 points against Tulsa, you were a main focal point of this offense. If you look at the team next year, by all accounts with the people that they're bringing in, they will be, they will at least have more depth. And with more depth becomes more opportunities for people and less opportunities for a guy like Mason Jones. Even if he played the same as he did this year, next year, he may not get as many shot opportunities because... Yeah, talking about minutes-wise, minutes he played wise. as many. Yeah. yeah, and so I think for him, you have to look at that and you have to say, can I put together a better season than what I did this year? And I think the answer right now, for him at least, is no. So why wait? Go, you put your best foot forward in your college season, go out there and see if you can't make some money playing professional ball. I, I think if he came back next year, you know, obviously he's going to be the number one guy on that roster if he does come back. So he's still going to be probably a guy that's top two in usage rate. But there's there's going to be far more playmakers on that team next year. So you wonder if he's going to I – mean, he's probably not going to be taking the same number of shots Um I wouldn't be surprised if like his free throw numbers went down because, you know, he got into the lane and got to the line a lot because he was about the only guy who could break opponents down um, by far and away the best one-on-one offensive player that Arkansas had. But I still think he could come back and have a good year, but I don't, I don't think it would be the type of year that he had this year just because you've got so many other guys that can create. So – it's gonna be gonna be an interesting next few months to to see what he does. But either way, I mean, you you have to pull for a guy like Mason because I mean he worked his tail off to to get to this point, and now he's you know just kind of he he opened up doors for himself that we didn't exactly think were even there for him. Right. You know after after the 2018-19 season. You're exactly right. So that it'll be interesting to see what happens in this upcoming few months. And like I said, there's just so many question marks around this season. If it was a normal season, how everything is playing out, there would still be a lot of question marks. But then you add in the fact that uh, with COVID-19 and going around of when will the NBA get back to play? When will the draft happen? What will happen with the draft? Uh, it adds even more to where you just you know shrug your shoulders and go, I don't know. And as a Razorback fan, you know now you're waiting for the other shoe to drop and see if Isaiah Joe will declare for the NBA draft. Yeah, that's the next big domino for mm-hmm. sure. I think Mason had generated enough like intrigue and interest just by what he did throughout the year that he may have been a guy that, you know, maybe received an invite to the NBA combine. I think so. Just so people could get, you know, a little bit further evaluation on him, but as of right now, and if it, it was everything's up in the air. And if it was a normal year, you would almost want both of those guys to declare. If you're a Razorback fan, you for sure want them to declare, actually, the more I think about it, because you're going to get that feedback. Whether or not they go, you want them to declare so you can see what they need to work on, what they can get better for the next game, because that just helps you as a Razorback. Uh, Daryl Macon and Jalen Barford did that, I believe, correct? Yeah. They, yeah, they after declared their, after their junior years and then they came back and had some stuff to work on and they got better from junior year to senior year if it was a normal year i'd almost expect isaiah to declare but that wouldn't necessarily mean that he would go now this year you can't be you can't be evaluated in person that's for sure so there's just as i said before there's just a ton of question marks around here and nobody has answers right now all right Moving on, after talking about those guys, we still have two season in reviews left to talk about, and we will start with the big man. I guess they're both big men, but we'll start with Reggie Chaney first. Chaney was just a strange player, I think, coming off the year. Yeah, he had a strange year. There were flashes to where you thought maybe he's the best big man on the team, and then there were also flashes where – you just shake your head and shrug your shoulders. Like, what's yeah, going on? some points where you just feel like you couldn't put him on the floor. All right, we'll start with strengths, Scotty, for Reggie Chaney. Yeah, you mentioned like the flashes that he showed. When Reggie was playing well, he was the best big on this team. And, you know, he, he kind of started the year in the doghouse a little bit, had the indefinite suspension that ended up lasting three games. And, I mean, he played – one of my one of my favorite notes that I've 
got on Reggie is that he really plays his best basketball when he gets some extended run, like he plays 20-plus minutes. He did that seven times this year, and he averaged nine points, eight rebounds, and shot just about 69% from the floor, which is nice. He was really good. Like when he was really good, he was really he good. was awesome. And when he was really good, he was hyper efficient around the rim. There was a point in January when I asked Eric Musselman about just, you know, Reggie just seems like he's got the magic touch around the rim and must was just went on and on about how, you know, throughout non conference Arkansas faced some pretty good rim protectors and he did did well there, like James Banks and Charles Bassey. Some of those guys didn't really affect Reggie. And then about a month through conference play, you know, when he had his head screwed on right, he was finishing around the rim, and that, that SEC length just didn't bother him one bit. And, you know, that was that was one of the the more unique things about the seasons because when, when Reggie was locked in, like he was he was a huge piece to this team and he provided some interior scoring. Um, another point that I'm that I've got in this in this season review was that he was an awesome offensive rebounder. Um, there were there were point <laughs> there were points in the year too when Muss was like Reggie's Reggie's doing a really good job on the offensive glass. We just need him to hit the defensive boards just as hard. Mm-hmm. Um, but Reggie, I thought, and this is a this is a trait that not a lot of bigs have, but the the good ones. I feel like have this, like some players are able to, when a shot goes up, they're able to like quickly analyze like the flight path of the shot and they can project whether it's going to miss short, long, left and right. And they can work themselves into, you know, advantageous rebounding positions. And I thought Reggie, Reggie had that, especially on the, on the offensive end. There's a lot of things that you can say about Cheney that, he did well or didn't do well. I think that what stands out here, though, Scotty, as we shift now maybe into some of his weaknesses, is the fact that you said when Cheney was on, mm-hmm. if Cheney could do this. And there were just too many ifs and wins. So in, really up and down here. In Cheney's game this year for him to be a consistent contributor to this team. For sure. And going back to the offensive rebounding thing for a minute, Jimmy Witt led Arkansas in offensive rebounds this year. He had 41, and he played almost 1,200 minutes and grabbed 41. Reggie Chaney had 39 and a little bit over 400 minutes. So that gives you an idea of, like, the the rate at which Reggie was. He had a third of the less minutes. Yeah. He played a third of the minutes. He played a third third of of the the minutes minutes that Jimmy did, and he finished with two fewer offensive rebounds. So that gives you a pretty good idea of the activity when again when reggie was engaged he was a he was a terrific offensive rebounder that was that that easily could have been like my number one point on him but um yeah he was he was pretty good when when like he really wanted to <laughs> he was he was pretty good and another point that i made in here was i thought reggie was a guy who would give arkansas really good minutes if something positive happened like early in his playing time and we talked about that on media rows a number of times during games, like especially during that Vanderbilt game at home when he kind of broke out from that early SEC funk uh, when he had the tech at, at LSU and then didn't really play much at Ole Miss the next time out. But he came into that Vanderbilt game like a man on a mission and I think scored 14 points, grabbed several rebounds, blocked some shots, dunked on a guy again. He really loved dunking on Vanderbilt players. And that that's something that that was kind of a, a fun trend to to note throughout his throughout his first two years but he was he was really good when you know when he was when he was active and and engaged so from your perspective from your analysis and you're not talking to the kid every single day or anything like that so we can only expect and understand what we see but from what you saw I'm going to ask the all important question. Why do you think Cheney was such a roller coaster player this year? That's a good question. I'm not like a hundred percent sure. Like I feel like a lot of people have their theories on it. You know, that's a good question. And this is just my personal opinion. I think Mus is a, Mus can be a really intense teacher of the game. And maybe that doesn't come across 
how he intends it to, to some kids who may be need to continue to grow more mature mentally. And so maybe some of that war on Reggie a little bit, not saying that that's Mus's fault in the least, because some, I mean, you, you need some, you need some constructive criticism at times for sure. Especially a guy like Reggie, when you see the, you see the flashes of potential, you see what like the, the, the ability is obviously there. Sometimes you need that constructive criticism to, to become better. I don't know if he was all the time receptive to it. Um, but he, I mean, must still said like, even when Reggie wasn't playing just a whole lot, he said that Reggie had a, a really good attitude, you know, behind the scenes. Um, but I think one of my, one of the things I, I talked about down at the, at the bottom was just his, his body language was not always great. And he wore those emotions on his sleeve. And I mean, it wasn't hard to tell at all when he was, he was upset or frustrated or, and I think he's just got to be able to grow mentally between his sophomore and his junior year. And he's got to be able to, you know, just if he makes a mistake on one possession, get up, get over it, like just get through it and keep playing. And I kind of wish in a way that Reggie would have been allowed to play through his mistakes a little bit more this year, but the margin for error with this team was so razor thin that you really couldn't afford to to leave him out there if he wasn't being productive. Yeah, that makes sense. Your your topic or your sentence about his body language, you didn't really realize it how many times he got a technical or how many times he kind of wore it on his sleeve until you went back and looked at it. And I read your article and yeah, that is true that that is, was one of his problems and one of the weaknesses in his game was he was emotional when it would come down to it, which sometimes players that are emotional can transfer that into good results. But at the same time, uh, emotion has to be contained at points as well. Yeah. It's just that mental hurdle. I think he's, he's got to get over like, you, dude, you're going to make mistakes over the course of a, a 40 minute game. Just don't let that bleed into what could be a really productive run for you and have that, have that split second of, Hey, I turned the ball over. I missed a shot right around the rim. Don't let that, don't let that affect you on the defensive end because you could, you could get back, say you missed a shot at the rim and it initiated a transition for the, for the opponent, like you can still get back and make a, a defensive play and get the ball back. And then you might be able to score when you're back on offense, like 10 seconds later, just get over that mental hurdle. Um, I don't know really what, what you do to, to grow there, but there are people far smarter than me that probably have some answers there. All right, moving on now to another big man. And it really was the last of the big men that we'll talk about here on the basketball podcast in Mid-America because the Razorbacks had Adriel Bailey, Reggie Chaney, and then this man who came on at the end of the season in Ethan Henderson. Ethan was a guy that was coming off the bench, and really this team had seven players all year long until, until Ethan Henderson started coming off the bench and really gave this team a jolt when, when he was needed. And all of a sudden... Just that one extra player going from seven to eight, I think it made a ton of difference just depth-wise for this team about being able to rotate guys in and out. And Henderson had a huge impact in the game on the defense and offensive side of the ball. Yeah, one of the things that I hated is just because the season ended so abruptly, like Ethan was playing his best basketball that he's played in his career. I mean, he was finally getting an opportunity to prove himself. And I remember there was after one game, I think it may have been the Tennessee game in Bud Walton Arena, he defended John Fulkerson, who was at that time was playing at like an all SEC first or second team level. And Ethan like blocked a shot two or three times, could have been credited with a couple more blocks. Mm -hmm. Like I remember he swatted one of Fulkerson's somewhat weak attempts at the rim, he swatted it out to almost the 28 foot marker. Like yeah. it was really impressive stuff. And Will Wade gave him props for that. Talking about how not many other bigs in the league have had the success against Fulkerson that, that Ethan had. And that's, that's pretty high praise because there's some, there's some good bigs in this league. And you no, know, he was in March, you know, I broke down the best month in his 
worst month in March, he was averaging almost four points, five rebounds, and about two and a half blocks a game. That's really good. That's really good stuff from a guy who's, you know, before I think leading into the month of February, he hadn't played 40 minutes all season. And now he's being asked to play a little bit of a bigger role because he was adapting to adapting very well and picking up what the coaching staff was wanting in terms of like their pick and roll coverage. And he was great with that. And so that led to, to a little bit more playing time for him. And when he was on the floor, he was really productive. It was, he was a lot of fun to watch down the stretch. He was, he had the link that this Razorback team needed. Absolutely. He was the one player on the team that you could look at and go, he's the guy that can get in the passing lanes, put a hand in the face, get the shot, and alter shots on the other side and maybe block some. And he really did have the link that the Razorbacks needed and missed. And just it wasn't clicking at the beginning of the year for whatever reason. But then I think I think it was about Ethan Henderson when Musselman was talking about when players are quiet in practice, you don't really understand how much they are understanding but he said as the season went on, Ethan became more and more and more vocal. Mm-hmm. And then he said, well, once you know that he's vocal, that means that he's understanding what's going on and that you can really utilize this guy in the offense. Yeah, that's when you feel like you can game. trust him. And he was used and utilized. And as you said, it was a bummer that the season ended so abruptly because I thought we were just now seeing Ethan at his full potential. I thought he I thought, you know, he was you know, early early in the year about the first time that we really saw Ethan doing his doing his thing was against Austin P when he came in and I think it, maybe Adrio Bailey picked up a couple of really quick fouls and must didn't feel super comfortable throwing in Gene Tosilla and so he just went a little bit farther down the line and picked up he was like Ethan it's your turn and he went in played seven minutes I think he offensive rebounded a, a missed three dunked dunked the miss and then grabbed three defensive rebounds and then blocked three shots. And I wrote in the in this story that, you know, Bud got loud a lot this year, but those few minutes that Ethan played against Austin P, he's got probably gonna be in the top ten because they were like, we're finally everybody's like, we're finally getting to see mm-hmm. Ethan when he's off his leash a little bit. So that was that was really fun. And then again that Tennessee game he came in and gave Gave Arkansas terrific minutes in that. So he was, like you said earlier, he was a he was a jolt off the bench when when you needed him. And I like this note that you have here about him and his turnovers. I'll go ahead and let you say it. Yeah. So Ethan obviously didn't play just a ton. Like if you looked at his minutes played, he's at 184, and he only turned the ball over twice. Gene Tosilla played 20 more minutes than Ethan did this year, and he turned the ball over 10 more times than Ethan. And so that obviously they're different players. Um, we didn't really get to see the playmaking that we thought Gene Tosillo might bring to this team. So Ethan obviously does not have the ball in his hands very often. Um, but he went, he played his last 163 minutes without a turnover. So that right there kind of tells me that he was keeping it about as, as simple as possible when he did have the ball in his hands. Um, you know, just you get the ball in your hands, either find a guard on a, on like a defensive rebound, find a guard as quick as you can um, on the offensive end. If you if you get your hands on the ball, you're either you're either going up with it or you're finding somebody on the perimeter to, to get the ball to or maybe, you know, finding another teammate who's unattended around the rim. He was he's he's pretty good. It's, it's really good to see, you know, because Reggie, Ch- Reggie Chaney's a guy that had a little bit of trouble with with turnovers. Um, either he had happy feet or he would he would make an errant pass. Um, but Ethan was a guy that, you know, he would he would come in and he wouldn't he wouldn't kill you with those live ball turnovers. He just wasn't one of those guys. So credit to him for that. That was that was a that was a pretty interesting note, I thought. Well, while Henderson did come on strong towards the end of the year, Scotty, and we really felt like we were just now seeing the Ethan Henderson that could live up to the potential. He was not without flaw. What were some of the weaknesses that you saw in his game? He just couldn't stay out of foul trouble. <laughs> like we we've talked <laughs> we've talked about it before. Like we talked about his his sky high fouls committed per forty minutes figure, which is like 
what was it? I'm looking in here. I think it was seven for the season, and in conference play, it was seven and a half. Like he had a couple of games, like at Florida, his first career start. He's finally getting his his shot. He scored seven points, grabbed three boards, blocked a shot, but he was only on the floor for ten minutes because he fouled out. <laughs> Like, and that goes back to, I think he's got to continue to grow as a defender. Like we talked about him growing in, in certain areas, especially like in Arkansas's pick and roll coverage. And he was a pretty, he was a decent shot blocker, rim protector, but he still had those moments where it felt like as a post defender, he would bite on just about every shot fake and he would kind of go for that, the first move in a, in a double move around the rim. And that's kind of what what got him in some some foul trouble. And Muss isn't going to play a guy very long, you know. If he Ethan's not going to allow yeah, him if to. Yeah, he just yeah, if he just racks up fouls, Ethan's going to be like, "All right, coach, I'm tired of running down, down the court. Here's my fifth foul, and sit on the bench." Exactly. I saw. I don't know if you said this or not, but in your story, according to Kim Palm, he led the team of fouls committed per 40 minutes with seven. Mm-hmm. He would commit seven fouls per 40 minutes played, which is pretty high. Yeah, there was one point it was at ten, was it not? I mean, it yeah, it was pushing ten. I, I would it, probably say after that Florida game, there I may have to go back to his Kim Palm page, but there was a point in the season when I, I remember I mentioned to you that his that number was pushing like nine and a half. Yeah, I think we laughed about that on this podcast, in fact, because we we were talking about he's pushing nine and a half, and he doesn't. He it doesn't was one of those things where we were laughing because it was kind of unbelievable that it was like that high it's yeah. not that we're like ha ah, ethan can't stay out of foul no trouble, no no, but, no. <laughs> but, it was but it, it was like that was a, a number you know you know that the guy fouls a lot but not exactly like that much in mm-hmm. over 40 minutes yep all right well that is the season reviews uh make sure to go into the description of this podcast if you're li- listening on your favorite podcasting app if you're listening and you are uh, listening on wholehogsports.com, you can make sure to uh, follow the links that are in the story. Either way, wherever you're listening, there will be links to the season reviews of Jalen Harris, Ethan Henderson, and Reggie Chaney. So make sure to check those out. You can get the full story, all of the stats that we're talking about. There's a lot of numbers in there for you numbers heads out there that and stats heads that like to look at the numbers. Scotty's got a ton of them out there. He's trying to satisfy your basketball itch right now as we – persevere through all of this together all right before we head on out of here scotty brought up a pretty interesting point and i thought that this was this was interesting to talk about because as i said there's not any sports going on so people are coming up with everything which by the way are you tired of brackets yet yeah yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of over them because I didn't. I mean, the one that you want to fill out is isn't there. You, and I get it. March is always the season for brackets. We're gonna rank the best fast food restaurants. We're gonna have the oh, best the fast food rankings. Are so tired. Yeah. Like you just like what you like. We're gonna have the best sports casters or whatever. I'm I'm over brackets now, and I I, I get it that you're trying to fill content, but at the same time, like, come on, man. This is this this is. I'm with it. you 100. percent so I'm tired of that. But as people are trying to come up with some topics, some are pretty interesting. And one is, who is the best player from your hometown that you thought would make it that just really did it? And uh, Scotty has a pretty interesting story. So I'll let you go ahead and tell you. Yeah. So I obviously, if you know anything about me, I grew up in a really small town in South Arkansas called Sparkman. It's a little bitty place, about 500 people between set between Arkadelphia and Camden. The only things to do in Sparkman are just like you can go to the park and just play ball. There's you can go to the elementary school. They got the you got two basketball courts called the slab. You just go play ball there. And the only things in Sparkman really, I think there's a restaurant, a gas station, and there's like three sawmills. And this like despite that, Sparkman had some really good athletes when like they've had good athletes in the past. But when I was in school, I played basketball with this kid named Gary Barry, and I'm not I'm not making the what I'm not ma- I'm not making the game I'm not making that up. He uh, he came from a really really athletic family. He had an older brother um, who went by the nickname Furl, and when he was in high school, he was he was one of those guys that was like six five or six six, and you know wasn't always 
the most engaged defensive player, but he played the top of Sparkman's 1-3-1 zone. And so anytime Sparkman got a defensive turnover, they would just throw it ahead to him. And everybody everybody in the gym, except for the the teammates on – like his teammates' parents were there to watch him dunk. Like that was pretty much it. Like that was the highlight. Um, but Gary, Gary came from a really athletic family. And in the seventh grade, Gary was running a 4.740. He was an, like, he was an athletic freak and he could not in basketball, he couldn't shoot himself out of a wet paper bag. Like he just didn't have a jumper, but he was the quickest dude on the floor. If he ever locked in on you defensively, he was going to take the ball from you. And if somehow you got around him, he was going to catch up with you and he was going to pin your layup to the glass and he could jump out of the gym he was about probably six foot, maybe, maybe 170, 175 pounds. He could just, he could fly. And he, I don't know that, he, I don't think he would have made it playing basketball just because he didn't really have much of a jump shot. But his sport that he just absolutely dominated was track. And I, like he would, I think his last two years in high school, he made it to the meet of champs and as Spartman's a one at class class A school, or it was. And he would go to the meet of champs and he would be competing with like the best in the state and like holding his own. So he was to me, he was one of the more gifted, just straight up track athletes, sprinters that the state had. And he would go there, he would compete in the triple jump. He was awesome at that, even though his technique was he was so raw. And he would run hurdles, Seth. He would run he would run up to the hurdle, jump over it, sprint do the same thing again and he would still win the races like he just had no form he wasn't taught form and he would run the 100 the 200 he would do really well there and then he would always do really well in the in the triple jump and the long jump but sparkman did not have like we didn't have a track like basically there was a our track we broke it down if you ran if you st- this if your starting if your starting line was where you used to buy tickets to get into the football game you would start there you would run up into the elementary school parking lot and then you would turn left and you'd go out to the street called boundary south boundary and then you would run down that until you got to the methodist church you would turn left and then you got to this guy named Bo Taylor's house and you would turn right down that street there was a stop sign you touched the stop sign and you came back you got back to the the ticket booth at the football field that was a mile that was your mile i feel like you're giving me directions in a small town are right, you gonna go past jim bob's house take yeah, a right real. that's basically what it was <laughs> that's incredible but if that's he incredible. if he had been taught like we we didn't have the the triple jump pit the long jump pit none of that and so basically he triple jumped on the football field for practice that's and then he just kind of went into those made of champs days and just kind of flew by the seat of his pants and he always did really well that's awesome running up he to was the a, hurdles he was a, a hell of a, a hell of an athlete and i remember my junior year we had one of the i thought one of the best teams at sparkman in about five or six years probably since gosh probably since pinto was in school Pinto played on some really good teams um, when I was in seventh, eighth, ninth grade. And we were at the regional tournament in Southside B Branch. We were playing a team called Mount Vernon Enola. We thought we had a good shot. Like that was one of the teams that we always got on Fearless Friday. Obviously, we got on the 1A basketball board nice. and posting updates. And we'd always hear about Mount Vernon Enola and how good they were. So we played them, it was a really high scoring game. And Gary, got checked out of one game and he was sitting over on the bench and then all of a sudden I hear a bunch of people start yelling back over toward our bench and apparently he had forgotten to take his medication and he was he like had a seizure on the bench during one of our games and so we had to play probably the last quarter and a half without him and we didn't see him until you know probably a couple hours after the game and he walked back into the hotel still wearing his his purple and white Nikes and his number 10 uniform. Like it was, it was a pretty scary moment, but that, that kid was, he was special. I wish he would have had a little bit more. I wish he would have had 
the opportunity to have more people invest in, in his athletic abilities, he could have turned into something pretty big. There you go. Gary Barry. That is not a made up name. That's hilarious. I, I guess one of mine coming from my high school was a good friend of mine. We were growing up and we became pretty good friends in seventh grade. And he started taking uh, lessons. He was a quarterback. He started doing throwing camps and stuff like that. And he was on our ninth grade team. So we played ninth and eighth grade together for football. And so we're playing and we made it through three or four games in the season. And our games were on Thursdays and the high school team was on Fridays. And we played our game on Thursday. We're watching the high school game on Friday, just joking around, whatever. And then all of a sudden the quarterback goes down for the high school team. And this is in the midway through the second quarter. And his name was Riley. Riley most of the time would sit on the sidelines and kind of just learn from the head coach. He'd sit beside him, kind of know what plays he's calling so he could understand. Cause he was really going to be the heir apparent in 10th grade. Whenever yep. it happened uh, that the guy, cause the guy that was a quarterback was a he senior. was next in line. Yeah, for sure. And then all of a sudden this guy goes down and coach just turns to him and goes, all right, go get dressed. And he's like, wait, what? And so, oh, so he wasn't even in uniform. No, he wasn't. And so wow. he's, he's going over to the locker room. They start putting him in uniform. One of the coaches goes with him. And it was, so the coach that went with him was our junior high coach. He was an assistant on the high school team. And he told the story afterwards. He's like, he's dying laughing after telling the story. Cause he's like, Riley's just shaking and yeah, putting imagine. on his football. But he's like about to go play seniors and he's a ninth grader, putting on his football pads or whatever. He's like, I don't know what's going on. And um, he went out, had to have been spinning. Oh my goodness. He went out there, did pretty well. I think he threw for a touchdown or two. It, it was crazy. He ended up starting the rest of the year and he was killing it. Um, he started freshman year, sophomore year, and then I may have get the timeline wrong, but I believe it was junior year. It was. It was his junior year, and all of a sudden, we're playing at home one of the first two, three games of the season, and he goes down in a heap, and it was his ankle, mm. and he broke his ankle. And he was getting looked at you know, kind of like by UCA, kind of those type of schools. Yeah. And, but, that, I mean, that's D1. Sure. And – his ankle goes down, he breaks it, he's out for the rest of the season. So he rehabs it, goes through all of this trouble to rehab his ankle, finally gets back. Uh, he's full speed, going through practice, like, all right, senior year, this is my opportunity, time to shine. Literally in the first three games again, they're at home again, and literally less than a foot from where he broke his ankle, he gets thrown to the ground and breaks his collar. Wow. And so he breaks his collarbone. He's out for the season again. He ended up walking on at UCA. They were probably going to offer him a scholarship, but yeah. then he walked on after breaking the two bones in two years. And he's like, as a walk-on, man, I just wasn't good enough to crack it. And he's like, so I ended, he ended up quitting after his freshman year. But I really felt like that guy had some potential. He was a stud. He was always uh, one of our favorite. When we played basketball, he played f- football, basketball, soccer. And whenever we played basketball together, he was a guy that would drive into the lane, one of the most athletic people at the school for sure. And he was yeah. just, man, you hate those injuries. Oh, for sure. For sure. They, injuries suck, man. For sure. All right. Well, we had fun with you today here on the basketball podcast of mid America. But before we wrap it up here, I almost, I almost ended us too soon. Uh, Scotty brought up a good point And uh, I wrote a story about Alexis Tolfrey that was on the website. It was on Monday. If you haven't read it, I really encourage you to, I can put the, link it was a terrific story in the description well done and uh i can put the link in the the description of the podcast here so you can go and look at it but he wanted some more information so we're gonna let him ask a few questions and see if we can't give you some more information about alexis tolfrey and her very unique story yeah i just i wanted to know what she was like to interview like i hadn't like obviously i've seen like some post-game interviews like the press conferences that she's done, but what was she like with you one-on-one? So it was pretty interesting. I interviewed her the Wednesday before everything shut down on Thursday. So okay. they had no idea. And there's kind of like the speculation going around of, hey, some schools are kind of closing. And it was really the speculation of, oh, we're going to play these things without any fans. Mm-hmm. It was really kind of what was going through everybody's mind. And so I sit down to start interviewing with her It's before they start practicing. And my neighbors did this really unique thing I don't know if I've talked about it with on this podcast or not, but he let media and staff and everything come into practice on right. that Wednesday or Thursday. And so before that practice, I sat down with Alexis and we're going through it. 
and we're about halfway through the interview and Mike Neighbors comes up in the middle of it and he's trying to put together the Whataburger fries yeah. The the you would see at the halftime show if you don't know what I'm talking about at halftime of the Razorback games, they put this huge Whataburger fry box out there and you'd have to throw fries into it. And he is putting together these fry boxes as a quote unquote halftime show for when they scrimmage mm-hmm. uh in the practice later. And so I'm interviewing Alexis, just asking her questions. So he's over here trying to put it together. It's like boom, dang. You listen to the the podcast or the replay of the interview i'm like we're gonna have to wait a second i can't hear you and he's still going around and i'm finally going do you need help and he's like (laughs) i wouldn't say no and so we alexis and i both get up and we stop the interview and so we we help him put together these fry boxes of all things and then he takes them over there and we sit back down like okay cool and then all of a sudden all of her teammates start coming in and they're shooting the basketball they're dribbling it or whatever and alexis just looks at me and goes do you want to go somewhere else like, yes, please. I can't yeah. hear this. And so we go. She was into another room, and she was really good interview. She answered questions. Uh, she she was really eloquent. I don't think that's the right word there. Um, she could she knew what she was going to say and said it. Yeah. Yeah. What was the most, like, interesting thing that she told you about her journey? So what she told me – about the ping pong match. Yeah, was, I wanted to know more about was that. was really interesting. Uh, so if you haven't read the story again, I encourage you to. But the, the background is that she was at Conway and she was a year younger than Jordan Danbury, who was a girl that ended up going to the University of Arkansas before transferring. Yeah, that girl was really good. Over to Mississippi State. And Jordan is a really good player. But Arkansas, she always wanted to go to Arkansas because she's from Conway. And she always wanted to be a Razorback is what she told me. But Jimmy Dykes' team really didn't need her. And they didn't really want to offer her because they didn't feel like they needed that spot on the roster. Uh, so they did it. And so she was kind of upset about it. She always wanted to be a Razorback, didn't get to do that. So she ended up committing to UCA. And her basketball coach, Ashley Hutchcraft, said, or her high school coach said, I think she did it because it was convenient and is what she had known. And so she commits to UCA. And before she even plays, She's like, this just isn't the fit for me. She, and so she ends up going to Mississippi for JUCO. Well, then she just starts lighting it up. Uh, she becomes a more mature person, a more mature player. And she really just had a three-point shot in high school. And if her three-point shot wasn't falling, then she wasn't going to be that that on tonight. Yeah. But she ended up working on her defensive game, working on a mid-range jumper. And Hutchcraft said you could tell the elevation in her game. Just She honestly said, I think it was just a maturity as a person coming along and realizing that, hey – if I want to get out of here and go play somewhere else, I've got to step up my game. And so all of a sudden she was a hot commodity. She's getting offers from Baylor, getting offers from That's solid. Well, yeah, just, just one of the better programs in women's basketball. She said she got basically an offer from every single sec school, except for South Carolina. And they're all recruiting her and wanting her. And then she gets that offer from the university. of Arkansas. she's like, this is a dream come true. But also, I don't want to rush into this. It still might not be the right, right fit. Right, right. And her high school coach said, neighbors worked it out to where he got the last visit. She went to a few other schools, and then he got the last visit. She said, once I knew the neighbors got the last visit, I was pretty sure Alexis was going to U of A. So she gets there, and she she really finds out that this is where she wants to be. So she challenges neighbors to a ping pong match. Alexis challenged Alexis challenged the neighbors. It wasn't the other way around. Alexis grabs the ping pong paddles, knowing full and well that she wanted to go to the U of A. And she goes, if you beat me in ping pong, then I will, I'll come to the university of Arkansas. I I don't know how much uh, the people that are listening know about coach neighbors, but he, he might earn the title for the most interesting man in the world. You know, those, those beer commercials, but he honestly might be, He's just got so many stories of being just a unique person. No, he's a darts fiend. He's a darts fiend. He collects movies, lunchboxes, shoes. I heard a story one time that he went out to a charity event and the main prize was if you hit a golf ball into this convertible, that if you hit the ball into the convertible, you won the convertible. I, I think I heard it wasn't, it wasn't running or something was the thing is like the convertible didn't run. And so I, I heard, I, this is maybe hearsay, so take it for with a grain of salt, but I heard that he hit the ball into the cup holder wow. of this convertible, 
they towed it over to his house. He put it there, and the ball has not left the cup holder. <laughs> I, I just such an interesting awesome. man. Well, one of his hidden talents, ping pong. Of course. And so he's going, all right, we'll do this. And Alexis, and I said, so are you any good at ping pong? She goes, oh, no, I'm trash. And so she said, he thought I was really good in setting him up until the very first shot when I hit it, and I didn't hit it very well. Yes, he had to have thought that she was going to at least – stand a chance right like if she was challenging him yeah and she said basically i was trash and so it went, it went by really quick and she ended up going to the u of a and loving it that's awesome um i think in the story too hutchcraft said that alexis was thinking about quitting playing basketball yeah it was this weird situation of she didn't really feel like she was getting what she deserved in a way of I have this talent in um it just isn't working out. I wanted to go to the U of A. It's I can't go to the U of A. I committed to Conway's. I wanted to be at home and I she wanted to be the person at Conway. She wanted to be probably the best player that they had ever had at the at UCA, the University of Central Arkansas. And she very well could have been, but then some things were, didn't work out. The coaching staff she said two or three coaches left by the time that she got there and so she just didn't really feel like everything was working out. And she's like, well, this is obviously just not working out. I might just quit. And a- Ashley Hutchcraft said that was not happening. We were not letting that happen. And she talked to her mom a lot through that process of we're not going to let this happen. And she ended up going to junior college. That's cool. Did she talk about her mom at all? Cause I saw her, you know, in the sec tournament, I think there were, I think the camera caught her mom Stand, obviously she was like in the first row behind the bench and she was wearing a t-shirt with like just Alexis flexing on it. Yeah, I talked to, I stole this question from you and you stole this question from somebody else, I believe, but asking players what their why is and mm-hmm. why they do what they do. Uh, I really think that's a really good question to kind of wrap up interviews. And she told me that she loves her mom and her family too. And that's one of the reasons why she gets out of bed and works and wanted to be because she wants to be able to provide for them one day and she loves her family and she talked about the t-shirts and she's like man i don't know she um she said something about i think one of her aunts made the first ones and her mom would wear a t-shirt with alexis face on it every time Mm -hmm. but then the special one that came out for the sec tournament i believe she wore that to senior night okay and it had alexis as a baby or a younger Alexis on one side, and then Alexis is a senior, and she That's awesome. she said, oh, "I was so embarrassed." And but at the same time, she's like, "I love I love the support, and my you know, coming to the U of A was great because my parents went to I think every game except for one or two this entire year." Uh, her mom, pardon me, her mom went to every single game except for one or two this entire year, and she really enjoyed the support that they gave her. Yeah, that's really cool. This this story, if y'all haven't read it yet, um, just go to Whole Hog. It's called Timing. Timing was just right for Alexis Tolfrey. It's a really good, you know, just peek behind the curtains of like the makings of, you know, the guard who ultimately became first team all SEC. She was the first one since like 2016, right? Yes, yeah, since and she Jackson. Was, uh, Jessica, Jessica Jackson. Jackson. Yeah, she was she was dynamite this year. Y'all need to get in there and read that story. It was really, really good, really good story, dude. Appreciate it. Yeah, it, it was interesting to see. Arkansas had – Two very similar stories happen on both the men's and women's side on the basketball. Mason Jones had a little bit better of a year and gets more publicity because he is in the men's basketball game. But Alexis Tolfrey went from that same, not really recruited very highly out of high school, goes to junior college, ends up going to the U of A and just busting onto the scene from a junior year where she felt like everything was just fast. One of the best quotes I think I ended up putting in the story was she said, I went from junior college where there was 30 people in the classroom and I knew everybody's name to where there's 300 and I can't even hear the professor, let alone know what they're saying. Yeah. I feel her pain there. <laughs> I mean, I came, I came from a high school where at, at certain times, like there were classes that were offered at Sparkman where it was distance learning. So my, the instructor was like on a TV in Maumelle and it's just me and one other kid in the class. <laughs> and like, I only had 12 or 13 kids in my graduating class. And so I get to Arkansas and my small class has got 25 or 30 kids in it. And then I go to, gosh, I can't remember what class it was. It may have been philosophy or psychology. 
and dude, there's 250, 300 people in in one auditorium. I'm like, this is as many people. There's as many people in this room as there are in my hometown. Uh-huh. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of time to adjust. I can I can relate to that, no doubt. That's a great story. I'll I'll set a link in this description as well so that y'all can go out and look at that story if you haven't. All right. I think that is everything. Anything else, Scotty? Yeah, I'm out. I'm out. Sorry, I ran this thing probably 20 minutes longer than you no, had planned. No, that's totally good. Totally good. Hey, basketball content. Everybody wants some right now. We are the show, the podcast to give you some great Razorback basketball content because that's that's what we do. We talk about the Razorbacks. We talk about basketball, football. That's what we do at Whole Hog Sports. We have guys dedicated to giving you the latest news. So make sure you check them out on wholehogsports.com. I've got my Adriel Bailey feature coming out. We're recording. What is today? Tuesday. Yes. This, it'll come out on Thursday. I finished it up. It was like 2,200 words. So bear with Insane. me. Insane. It's not just like a huge one huge block of text. There's some. I got some pretty cool photos of Adriel and his dad, and Adriel and his high school guidance counselor Fanny Holden. She was texting me. She texted me like two or three different photos, and so I found a way to put put one of them in there. I thought was probably the best that she sent. So. It'll be a fun story. I'm glad I'm finally getting that one out. Awesome. I feel like I've been teasing it for like two weeks. Well, it, when you have 2,200 words, it normally takes just a second to, to get it out. Yeah, I broke it up into four different sections, so it wasn't just so it wasn't just like put you to sleep. Just this thing's never going to end. <laughs> All right. Well, for Scotty Borderline and the entire Hologsports.com crew, I am Seth Campbell saying thank you for joining us, and we will see you back here next week.